lose belly fat overnight, lose belly fat in three days, lose belly fat with this exercise. These are just some of the titles of various contents that pompously mislead people into the idea that losing belly fat is so easy and can be done really fast. Well, newsflash, most of them are lying. Iron. And you deserve to know the truth on how to really lose belly fat for good. Hello my dears and welcome. I'm Marina, a registered dietitian with over 10 years of experience counseling clients on their weight loss journeys. Having lost 80 pounds myself, I really understand the challenges of obesity and weight loss and I'm here to be your guide on your weight loss journey. Today we will tackle that stubborn belly fat that seems really impossible to lose. Firstly, we will address the dangers of belly fat and importance of losing it. Secondly, we will reveal if it's really possible to lose just the belly fat. And finally, we will decide on the best diet and exercise regime. But before we dive in, I want to draw your attention to something often overlooked. Yes, excess belly fat bothers us for various reasons. It's hard to button up our favorite pants, a tight dress doesn't fit us well, we feel the rolls when we sit down or have a hard time tying our shoes. But this aesthetic aspect is actually not our biggest problem. Although we know that in general obesity is associated with numerous health risks, we underestimate the dangers of excess belly fat. Because when it comes to our body fat, location really counts. Location, location, location. In our bodies, there are primary two types of depots for fat storage. Subcutaneous, which lies just beneath the skin and can be found all over the body, and intra-abdominal or visceral, which surrounds organs in the abdominal cavity in our belly area. While both of these tissue types are important, visceral fat has garnered particular attention due to its association with various health issues. Subcutaneous fat, comprising about 80 to 90% of body fat, is visible and can be felt like that soft belly rolls we often critique in the mirror. In contrast, Visceral fat, which we can see, resides deep inside the abdomen, around organs like the liver, pancreas, and other organs such as the omentum, a fold of tissue resembling an apron. When this omentum gets fatter, it becomes thicker and harder, so that's why some people, mostly men, don't have soft but rather hard bellies, sometimes referred to as beer bellies. Well, that's a common misconception suggesting that beer consumption directly leads to the accumulation of belly fat. However, studies have shown that beer consumption doesn't specifically target belly fat increase, but instead can contribute to overall weight gain. While visceral fat constitutes a smaller proportion of body fat overall, it adheres to the saying, poison is in small bottles. We will address that in a minute. According to where the fat is mostly accumulated in our bodies, we can classify obesity into two types. Central or abdominal obesity, sometimes also referred to as android obesity type, where fat mostly occupies the abdominal midsection region, and the second type, known as peripheral or gynoid type of obesity, where fat is accumulated more around hips, buttocks, and thigh areas. In everyday life, of course, we don't use those terms, but you've probably heard terms like apple and pear body shape, which is exactly that. People with apple shape body types tend to have a larger waist to hip ratio, meaning their waist is larger or close to equivalent in circumference to their hips. Usually we see this fat distribution in men because they have higher tendency to accumulate abdominal fat compared to premenopausal women. 
apple-shaped body type is also prevalent among menopausal women, where decreases in estrogen levels during menopause can actually lead to a shift in where fat is stored in the body, with more fat accumulating in the abdomen even if they don't gain any weight. On the contrary, people with pear body shape often have a smaller waist to hip ratio, which means their hips are usually wider than their waist and they also have smaller waist circumference compared to apple shaped body type. We usually see this type of fat distribution in women of childbearing age who generally tend to store more fat on the periphery and not in the central part of our bodies. Certainly, we can't always automatically assume that the shape of someone's body determines their metabolic health. But certain body shapes in relation to obesity do carry more health risk factors. People with apple-shaped body type and that extra belly fat are unfortunately more at risk for developing cardiovascular disease, diabetes and other health problems comparing to pear-shaped individuals because of that visceral intra-abdominal fat inside bellies. Through history, extra body fat was great storage energy depot for surviving the times of famine and also served as a cushion for our organs, but today we know that fat cells, particularly visceral fat cells, are highly metabolically active. Visceral fat is associated with insulin resistance, a predisposition to diabetes, local and systemic inflammation, dyslipidemia and dysglycemia, adipose tissue and systematic inflammation, hypertension, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Furthermore, visceral is also associated with greater risk for cardiovascular disease and certain cancers. On to the even more upsetting news. We don't have control over where in our body fat is stored. This mainly comes down to genetics, sex and age. Women generally have higher body fat percentage than men and store more body fat in the lower part of the body. Think pear shape. Elderly people also tend to have a higher body fat because as people age, their metabolic rate decreases due to declines in muscle mass and physical activity. As we mentioned earlier, overweight men typically store excess fat in their bellies. Think apple shape. Hormonal changes, particularly for women with decreases in estrogen levels during menopause, can also lead to a shift in where fat is stored in the body, with more fat accumulating in the abdomen, even if overall weight remains stable. A recent study confirmed heritability of our body fat distribution and identified almost 100 genes that affect that distribution. They even showed that this effect is present predominantly in women and to a much lower extent in men. So ladies, thank your mamas for your hips. Your mom's hips don't lie! Because extra fat on hips and not on the belly is actually shown to even have some protective properties. But let's not forget about belly fat. To determine if it's indeed just an anesthetics problem or can pose a danger to your health, don't solely rely on estimates such as your weight and BMI. For home monitoring of dangerous visceral fat, use tape measure. Measure your waistline at the navel, not the narrowest part of the torso, and don't suck in. As people all over the world genetically differentiate, International Diabetes Federation defined abdominal obesity with the use of ethnic-specific criteria and proposes this waist circumference cut points. Waist circumference is important for everybody, but especially for people who fall in the healthy weight range according to the BMI, because even though these individuals may have normal weight, they can have high waist circumference and excess fat on belly region.
and therefore they are still at risk for developing health complications even more as someone who falls in the overweight category but stores fat mostly in the lower body. But to summarize those numbers in terms of harmful visceral fat, a waist circumference of 88 centimeters or 35 inches or larger in women generally indicates excess visceral fat and significantly increased health risks and for men 102 centimeters or 40 inches or larger. So in conclusion, even though it sounds funny, it's true. It's better to have big old butt than big old belly. I big butts and I cannot lie. Now for the burning questions. Can we lose just the belly fat? Spot reduction, the idea of targeting specific areas of the body for fat loss, is a persistent myth in the realm of fitness and weight loss. Despite the desire for a toned abdomen, it's crucial to understand that spot reduction of belly fat through targeted dieting is simply not possible. Fat loss occurs throughout the body only in response to a calorie deficit. The basic principle is this. To lose fat, you need to create a calorie deficit, meaning you burn more calories than you consume. In response to this deficit, the body taps into its fat stores for energy. Fat cells, also known as adipocyte, store an excess energy in the form of triglycerides and they are distributed all over our body, not just in the belly area. When you are in a calorie deficit, the body signals these fat cells to break down those triglycerides into fatty acid and glycerol and releases them into the bloodstream. Once in the bloodstream, they are transported to different tissues in our body when they are used for energy production. So we can just say, today I'm burning only my belly fat. My body doesn't burn fat, it burns muscle. Because here's where genetics and hormones come to play. For example, individuals with an apple-shaped body type, which tends to have more visceral fat, may experience slower belly fat loss, while those with a pear-shaped body type, which often has more subcutaneous fat, may notice changes in their belly area sooner. This distribution pattern is largely determined by genetic predisposition and hormonal influences. Belly fat loss, both subcutaneous and that dangerous visceral fat, will happen proportionate with overall fat loss, but usually you need to lose quite a lot of weight to see the results on your belly, except if you are genetically blessed. Additionally, the body's fat metabolism is not targeted to specific muscles being exercised. While exercise can help create a calorie deficit and promote fat loss overall, it doesn't necessarily result in localized fat loss. However, some findings do suggest that exercise, even without weight loss, can help reduce visceral fat, the more dangerous fat that we can see. But for our belly fat rolls, meaning subcutaneous fat, doing hundreds of crunches won't magically melt away belly fat, even if those muscles do get stronger. Instead, consistent exercise combined with a healthy diet helps create the necessary conditions for fat loss throughout their body. For some people, substantial overall fat loss may be necessary to see a difference in the belly area and typically the areas that bother you the most will see the results last. It's not fair! Talk about fair. So, remember that while you can spot reduce fat from specific area like belly, adopting a balanced approach to diet and exercise will support overall fat loss and lead to improvements in body composition over time. And scientific studies have consistently demonstrated the effectiveness of overall weight loss in reducing both subcutaneous and visceral fat in men and women. Now let's look at the diet and exercise. 
when it comes to diet, it's clear that achieving calorie deficit is key to losing belly fat. Calorie restriction not only reduces overall body fat, but also targets both subcutaneous and visceral fat. However, delving deeper, a meta-analysis conducted by Vergen and colleagues compared caloric restriction with exercise training, revealing that while a hypocaloric diet alone led to more significant weight loss, exercise training show a larger decrease in visceral fat compared to calorie restriction alone. Surprisingly, even without weight loss, exercise training resulted in over a 5% reduction in visceral fat, whereas calorie restricted diets barely affected visceral fat. This underscores that solely assessing changes in total body weight overlooks important health benefits. Exercising can effectively reduce visceral fat independent of weight loss. However, to address subcutaneous fat, the visible fat that troubles us, a calorie deficit is necessary as calorie restriction has a more significant impact on overall weight loss than exercise alone. Notably, men tend to experience greater reductions in visceral fat in both exercise and diet interventions, possibly due to their larger visceral fat stores compared to women. Researchers conclude that exercise training, despite its lesser impact on body weight reduction, yields superior effects of reducing visceral fat adipose tissue compared to diet interventions in overweight and obese individuals. Therefore, the optimal approach is to combine dietary modifications with regular exercise to achieve the best results. Now, let's look at the diet alone. Establishing a calorie deficit is paramount for achieving fat loss and there are numerous approaches that cater to different individuals. Whether you are for a specific diet plan like low-fat, low-carb or plant-based or prefer time-restricted methods such as intermittent fasting, each serves as a tool for creating the necessary calorie deficit. Similarly, you may choose to track your calorie intake through methods like calorie counting or prioritize portion control. Regardless of the approach, it's crucial to emphasize whole foods and adopt an 80-20 approach where 80% of your diet consists of nutrient-dense foods like fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, whole grains, and unsaturated fats, while the remaining 20% allows for flexibility with higher calorie fun foods in moderate portions. Additionally, it's good to reduce your consumption of sugary beverages by substituting them with water, unsweetened tea, or other non-caloric options. Also, consider cutting back on alcohol intake to further reduce calorie consumption and be mindful about snacking and overall food intake. Regardless of the approach chosen, some form of dietary restraint is essential to achieve a calorie deficit. However, before embarking on any dietary changes, it's wise to assess your current calorie intake to understand your starting point. This can be done through tracking apps or maintaining a food diary for a few days. Once you have a clear picture of your eating habits, you can adjust accordingly by swapping higher calorie foods for lower calorie options, controlling portion sizes, and increasing your intake of fruits, vegetables, and lean proteins. To establish a calorie deficit, you can use online calculators to estimate your energy needs and then subtract a certain number of calories to achieve the desired deficit. Research suggests that a deficit of 300 to 750 calories per day is commonly recommended for sustainable weight loss, equating to around a 10 to 20% reduction from your total daily energy expenditure. However, individual requirements and circumstances vary significantly and that's why that number can be a spectrum. 
lean protein sources like meats, fish, eggs, dairy, legumes, and soy products can help preserve muscle mass during fat loss and promote satiety. Additionally, include plenty of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains for their fiber content, which aids in fullness and reduces calorie absorption. Incorporate heart-healthy fats like olive oil, avocados, nuts and seeds, but be mindful of portion sizes due to their higher calorie content. Limit saturated fats found in fatty meats, cheeses and sweets as these can contribute to visceral fat accumulation. Ultimately, consistency is key in adhering to your diet and exercise regimen. While progress may take time, focus on adopting a sustainable lifestyle plan that you can maintain long-term rather than fixating on short-term results or numbers. Remember, significant fat loss, especially in the belly area, requires patience and dedication to your overall health journey. I hate her. I hate her! On to the exercise part. As for myself, I do exercise regularly and go on daily walks with my pet child. Still, I'm no fitness expert, but there is some interesting information to explore in this field. To knowledge. To knowledge. And let's start with the most important one. As we lose weight, we risk losing muscle mass if our protein intake is too low and if we neglect muscle stimulation. Losing muscle along with fat might show greater overall weight loss on the scale, but this is not desirable outcome. More muscle means higher energy need, allowing us to eat more. So maintaining or even building muscle through weight training makes it easier to sustain weight loss. Conversely, losing too much muscle can lead to increased hunger. That's why resistance type exercise training and a high protein intake are recommended, especially for individuals with obesity undergoing weight loss to prevent muscle loss. Studies like the one by Vispute and colleagues have shown the effectiveness of progressive resistance training in reducing both abdominal subcutaneous and visceral fat even without significant changes in body weight. Also, aerobic exercise of moderate to vigorous intensity is important and it seems to have a greater effect on visceral fat than low-intensity aerobic exercise or strength training. And the most interesting finding, overall exercise can reduce dangerous visceral fat inside our bellies even without losing weight. But what about those targeted belly fat exercises? While abdominal exercises do strengthen the core, they may not be effective in reducing abdominal fat on their own. It is likely necessary to combine them with aerobic exercise and reduced energy intake for more favorable changes in body fat percentage. Training core is beneficial for stability and good posture, but F exercises alone will not give us less belly fat, just more defined muscles underneath. But we won't be able to see them unless we lose overall fat and along goes the belly fat. So, to sum up my thoughts as non-expert in training. Focus on strength training to maintain muscles during weight loss. Incorporate aerobic exercise or simply move more in your day-to-day -day life for heart health and lowering visceral fat and to create an extra in a calorie deficit. Exercise can reduce dangerous visceral fat inside our bellies, but mostly remember, any exercise contributes to a healthier lifestyle better appetite regulation, improves sleep, and positively impacts our overall and mental health. In the lifestyle department, getting adequate sleep is crucial as sleep restriction can lead to increased hunger and weight gain, particularly visceral fat accumulation inside our bellies. Mindfulness techniques 
to reduce stress levels are also important as stress can trigger increased hunger and snacking, making it harder to achieve a calorie deficit. In closing, it's vital to embrace the understanding that targeting belly fat directly is mostly a myth. It's a myth. Yes, exercising can help reduce some percentage of visceral internal fat, but it may not target the visible fat rolls that concerns us, though it's undeniably beneficial for our overall health. Belly fat will melt away as a part of a holistic fat loss journey throughout the body and with consistent effort, changes will manifest in our belly area too. For sure, this path varies for each of us, influenced by our unique genetic makeup, presenting different challenges and triumphs along the way. But with a commitment to a well-rounded approach, incorporating a balanced diet with calorie restriction, prioritizing lean proteins and fiber, and complementing it all with consistent exercise, you will witness transformation. You look amazing. Remember, it's the daily dedication, patience, and perseverance that paved the way to success. Thank you for joining me today, and if you found these insights valuable, be sure to spread the word, hit that like button, and subscribe for more content like this. Your support really means a lot. Stay inspired, stay motivated, and until we meet again. Bye!